Okay, now we've taken a look at the loss function in detail. Let's delve into the Suave code using PyTorch Lightning. Okay, we now look at the code for Suave. We start our collab with these two uh, pip installs. What I'll do is copy paste the ResNet code from the Suave repository that uh, they have. The reason I'm copy, copying this code for ResNet is it's like the backbone itself for this ResNet is not different than the say ResNet present in PyTorch. As you can see, like all these calls are the same, but the difference comes in this forward function where this uh, module basically expects a list of inputs for say six different views, two of uh, two which are say of size 224 for the image net and then the remaining four which are small parts of the image and are of size 96. And what this forward function does is it passes each one of them through the forward backbone and concatenates all of those along the batch dimension here and it, uh, yeah, concatenates each one of those along the batch dimension here. And say, if you had a batch size of two and you have six different views, then you'll get an output of 12 comma 2048 from a ResNet 50 backbone. And once that you have that out output, you send it to the forward head function, which basically gets you the, which, passes this through the projection head and the prototypes. And yeah, so the output of this ResNet, the Suave ResNet is your X and the prototypes for these representations. We then go on to define imports for the transform. And then we define the Gaussian blur. And once we have the Gaussian blur in place, we can define the train data transform for Suave. If you look at this function, this might seem a bit complicated, not function, sorry, class. Uh, this might seem a bit complicated in the beginning, but the transformations are pretty much what Simpler is doing. So what you do is you define your standard color jitter, uh, grayscale, uh, Gaussian kernel, and these things. And then you iterate over the size crop. So for ImageNet, the self.size crop say here is this comma 96. So you iterate over these sizes, you define the random resize for them, and you add the remaining transform, and then you multiply this whole thing with number of crops. So for, again, for ImageNet, this is 2, 4, which indicates you have two crops of size 224, and the remaining four are, are of size 96. And hence, you have six transforms here defined within this uh, list of transforms. Now, once you have all those transforms, uh, this is something additional which we add in bowls as one more view, which gives you the transform for the online fine tuning thing that we have, the online fine tuning callback. And the seventh transform we append is for that. So now for this train data transform class, we simply take in a sample, apply all the seven different views all the seven different transform to generate seven different views of an image and then return all of those as a list. Now, defining validation data transform for Suave is pretty much trivial after this. We simply subclass the train data transform as the first six transforms for generating six, six different views are basically same for the validation set as well. And we simply substitute the seventh transform that we define with the evaluation transform for our online uh, fine tuning. And that's it. That's the definition of eval data transform class in Suave. Once we are done with the transforms, we start defining the imports for our Suave module here. And then we move on to defining our Suave module itself. Uh, yeah, here's a bunch of things that are present, parameters that are present and in input, which basically uh, initialize the swap module with these parameters. And once you have that, we define our ResNet 50 backbone. Now uh, we move on to define the linear warmup plus cosine decay schedule for the swap module. And the reason we have to 
define this manually and we can't use the linear warm-up cosine decay scheduler from Bowles is because we use the Lars wrapper optimizer. And Lars wrapper doesn't subclass from the optimizer class in PyTorch and hence you can't apply a standard scheduler to it. So this is nothing complicated. Again, you define a linear warm-up here uh, based on the number of iterations and then you define the cosine decay schedule and then you simply concatenate these two what this list or yeah what this numpy array would do is it would set the learning rate using this array uh, at each iteration during the training and this learning rate would be set for each parameter group present in the model we are done with the init function we define the forward function now the forward function simply gives the output of the backbone of the SWAV ResNet that we saw earlier. And the reason for this is during inference, you should be able to call, uh, you should be able to define model equals to SWAV and then simply call model X over an image and get the representation from the encoder. And hence we just define uh, uh, this as the output of the backbone and not the whole SWAV module. Okay, now this is an interesting usage of on after backward hook from lightning. The reason we use this here is we have to set the gradients of prototypes to none in the initial epochs of training. Uh, this is done to stabilize the training so that the prototypes themselves do not move around a lot. And for this, you simply override the on after backward and define the gra gradients of prototype to be none. Once we define that trick for prototypes, we move on to configuring the optimizers. Here we have a standard SGD and we wrap it in Lars wrapper and return this. There's no scheduler in this function because uh, I, like I mentioned before, uh, Lars wrapper doesn't subclass the uh, PyTorch optimizer uh, class and hence a standard scheduler won't work on it. To actually set the learning rate for parameter groups of model, we override the optimizer step function from Lightning. This is something that you don't need to do often, but in this case, it's really helpful. So the, optim the optimizer step in Lightning uh, calls the optimizer.step and passes in the closure. But before this is called, you can actually set the learning rate for each parameter group from your schedule that you created in init. And as you can see, we iterate over uh, each parameter group and use optimizer.optim because optimizer variable was our uh, Lars wrapper and Lars wrapper contains the optimizer pass to it in self.optim and hence you iterate over this. Also the learning rate logger callback won't work here because Again, Lars wrapper is simply subclassing the object class and hence we manually log the learning rate just for uh, a sanity check. And then this is super important. Since we are overriding this method from the lightning module, we do need to copy this part from the lightning modules default implementation so that optimizer.step is actually called during our training of lightning of this uh, module. All right, finally we reach the sinkhorn function, the MVP of this whole paper. So this is something that we also discuss in more detail in our explanation for this paper. But the idea is simple. You have a Q matrix and what you do is you normalize the individual values with the sum over all values. Then you define U, R, C, which are like three vectors. Uh, U is a bunch of zeros, R and C is a bunch of ones. Uh, you set U to be a sum over dimension one of Q, and then you multiply Q with basically one over sum of the uh, rows. So you scale each row to one by K, and then you scale each column to one by uh, B, where B is the batch size. So that's what you do. I, uh, in a repeating manner here. And that's the Syncorn algorithm for normalizing, or not just normalizing, but uh, optimizing to compute the ideal Q. Now, once all of this is done, we move to define our training and validation steps here, which 
uh, since they share a lot of things in common, we simply call a shared step over the batch being passed to them and simply log the loss in both these cases. The only difference in logging being that for training, we log on each step, but for validation, we log at the end of epoch. And now we uh, have to define the shared step to actually make this work. So let's go to that. Now we define the shared step here, and this is probably the most complicated piece of code in all of the Swarm module. So let's walk over it step by step. Uh, this is something standard that we do for the STL10 data module in Bolts because it has both the labeled and unlabeled batch being passed together. Uh, we get the inputs and the Y from the batch. And if you remember, the inputs here is a list of different views. And the reason we removed the last one is because the last view was reserved for the online evaluation or, or the online fine tuning that we do using a callback on the SOAV model being trained. Now, the first step in, which is a part of the algorithm itself is to normalize the prototypes without using any gradients. The second step is to get both the embeddings and the prototype uh, vectors here from the model. Uh, you pass everything as a list and in input, like all the different views that were present. And then at the end of it, receive, say, whatever was the batch size into the number of views, comma, whatever the dimension of embedding and whatever the dimension of the prototype is. Okay, we move to this part of the code now, which looks really complex, but let's break it down line by line so that it becomes easier. So to compute the swap loss, we have to remember that the codes Q are computed only for a specific or certain number of views and not for all of them. And all the remainder views are used to predict the, uh, those codes. So if you, so in the general case of ImageNet, you define the self dot crops for assign hyperparameters zero and one, which means you are computing the codes Q for the two big views of size 224. And now say for the zeroth view, you compute Q and you'll use all the remainder views to predict this Q. And similarly, when you move to the next uh, iteration of this for loop, you would get the Q for the first view and you will use all the other views, all the other five views to predict this Q. So uh, this line here defines, since uh, the output of the ResNet combined the batch and the number of views dimension. So if you had a batch size B and you have six different views, so you have the zero dimension as six uh, B instead of just B. So you extract the outputs corresponding to the view for which you want to compute this uh, Q matrix. You pass that to the get assignments function, which basically computes the Q using the sync horn. We define that here. Now, once you have this Q computed for this, you run an inner for loop, which, which basically predicts this code matrix Q using all the other views except for this one. And once you're done with that, you move to the next iteration get the queue for the first view instead of the zero as now, and then again, predict the queue for the first view using all the other remaining views. And once you have these two inner loops, you exit this, add everything to the common loss and then return the value. That's the complex uh, thing that this piece of code is doing here. And that's, that's all to this whole thing. Okay, now we have all of this defined for us. This is where Lightning makes things super easy for you. I can define my whole training regime within a few lines after this. So I start by define, uh, I start by calling in the online evaluator and my data module for STL. I define a bunch of hyperparameters for STL. So these are slightly different than ImageNet. Say the size crops are 96 and 36. I keep the same number of uh, views here. I change the minimum and maximum scale crops and adjust a few things around. So I'm instead of say using 3000 prototypes, I'm just using 512. Uh, say, yeah, that, that's one change. And just for this uh, 
training, I am running for 100 epochs instead of say eight, the 800 which they used on ImageNet. Let's, let's make things a bit simpler here and let's define the Atom optimizer. The original paper uses SGD, but just for this example, we can define, we can change this to Atom. Change a few things here, and hence the learning rate uh, in my hyperparameter is actually according to the Atom optimizer. The next part of my code just gives out some definition for data modules, where I define my data module. Uh, this is a hack which we need, we do for uh, STL10 in particular. You don't have to do it for other data modules. STL10 outputs both the labeled and unlabeled batches at the same time, and hence we do this, where we assign the train and validation data loader with, the mix, with their mixed counterparts. And now within this data module, we assign them the transforms that we defined earlier. Once we are done defining everything for our data module, we move on to the actual definition of the swap module here. And then that is followed by the on online evaluator callback which evaluates the features generated by our encoder in an online fashion. This is done to ensure that we can cancel any runs which are going horribly wrong or not learning at all. After all of that, we move to the final part of defining the trainer and calling it. And that's it, this should be it. This starts my training here and we'll fast forward through this a bit all right, we jumped right ahead to where the training starts, and this is it. So thank you for joining me for this code session of Swab. We'll be putting more videos like this and simpler out in the future.